Welcome back guys. In this video we're going to use the integral test that we talked about in the last video to determine when a p-series converges. This is a particularly important series. Now it looks like we've got a lot of variables here. This is, this is the form of a general p-series. Um, now p is generally a number. Now remember n is the index of the summation. So if I evaluate this at n equals 1, I get 1 over 1 to the p. That's my n equals 1 term. When n equals 2, I get 1 over 2 to the p. When n equals 3, I get 1 over 3 to the p. Then 1 over 4 to the p, and so on. So this is a p-series. Just to give you some concrete examples, Here's one concrete example. The sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of n cubed. That's 1 over 1 cubed plus 1 over 2 cubed plus 1 over 3 cubed plus 1 over 4 cubed. Here p is clearly 3. We're raising all those denominators to the third power. And so the nth term is 1 over um, n cubed. And of course we could simplify these. We'll call that 1. Um, this is 1 8th. This is 1 over 27. Uh, 1 over 64 and so on. Um, here's another p-series, although it doesn't look like it, or it may not look like it on the surface. But remember, anytime you have um, a root or a radical in your expression, there's an implied 2 there. If it's a square root, there's an, um, that's the index. It's implied 2. Otherwise, the index is going to be explicitly shown. Um, and if you don't have an exponent here, there's an implied 1 there. So using our exponent properties, the nth root of x to the m is x to the m over n. So the index of the root goes in the denominator. This can be written this way. This is 1 over n to the 1 half power. And so when I write it this way, it's more obvious that that's a p-series and p is equal to 1 half. So this p-series looks like this. I get 1 over the square root of 1 plus 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1 over the square root of 3, 1 over the square root of 4, and we keep going. And that's what that p-series looks like. So a p-series is just a series that looks like this. Now it turns out that for some values of p, this converges. For other values of p, this diverges. And we like to come up with just a rule. When I see a p, p equals 3, I'd like to be able to just look at it and say, oh, that's a p-series of p equals 3. That means it converges, or that means it diverges. So we're going to use the integral test to come up with that rule for p-series. Um, we're going to call that new rule the p-series test. So we're deriving, in this video, we're deriving the conclusions of the p-series test. Okay, so let's do it. We're going to derive the conclusions using the integral test. That's why it's in this section. So if this is our p-series, that's our a sub n. That means f of x should be exactly the same as this, but the n is going to be replaced with an x. So I've got 1 over x to the p. Um, now, as long as p is positive, um, This is 1 over x to a positive power. This is a positive function. 
In order to um, use the integral test, I'm, I'm going to go through and check the conditions of the integral test. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. So first I let f of x, or define f of x, and then we're going to check the conditions of the integral test. Okay, and so let's use the integral test for p positive and then we'll talk about what happens when p is negative. As long as p is positive, um, <clears throat> and we're assuming we're on the interval from 1 to infinity, uh, I've got to check three things. Is f positive on the interval from 1 to infinity? And I think it is. So let's say the first thing we know is f of x is 1 over x to the p. If p is positive, this is 1 over a positive number raised to a positive power. Um, so this is going to be positive. Because x is positive when we're on the interval from 1 to infinity. And that means x to the p is positive when we're on that interval from 1 to infinity. Um, and if x to the p is positive, 1 over x to the p is positive. So that implies that 1 over x to the p is positive. Okay, so we check that f is positive. The next thing we need to check is that f is continuous. We can say yes, power functions are continuous. Um, and this is continuous um, as long as the denominator is not 0. The only way the denominator, denominator would be 0 is if x is 0. And x equals 0 is not on our interval. So we can say yes, f is continuous. because it is a well-defined function of x. Well-defined function given by an equation, and all of those are continuous on their domains, um, on the interval from 1 to infinity, because we're not dividing by 0 there. That's the last thing we need to check. We need to check to make sure it's decreasing. Now, in order to check to see that it's decreasing, we might want to write f of x as x to the negative p power using exponent properties. And we want to compute the derivative of f. So f prime is negative p times x to the negative p minus 1. Now, we assumed that p was positive. Now this is x to a negative power. If I want, I could factor out that negative 1, and I'll have p, x to the negative p plus 1. So this is x to the p plus 1. So I've got a negative number divided by x, which is a positive number, to a positive power. So it's a negative over a positive. That's going to be negative for x in the interval from 1 to infinity. So we computed f prime. We've shown or that f prime is uh, less than 0 eventually for x in the interval that we're interested in or on the end of that interval we're interested in. And since the derivative is negative, we know derivative is negative means that the function is decreasing. on the interval that we're talking about. All right, so f is positive, continuous, and decreasing. That's nice. So that means the integral test applies. Yay, that means we get to do that integral test. Woohoo!
All right. So now I just have to evaluate the integral from 1 to infinity of this and um, see what happens. If the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx. Now it's an improper integral, so the first thing we do is always to write the improper integral as the limit, because that's what it is. It's always a limit of a proper integral. Um, the upper limit is infinite, so we're going to replace that infinity with a b, and we're going to let b go to infinity, leave everything else exactly the same, except you've replaced the upper limit of infinity with a b, and then you've got 1 over x to the p right here. So we always start when we're evaluating an improper integral by writing the improper integral as a limit. As a limit. Okay, now that we've written it as a limit, we've got to evaluate this proper integral. In order to evaluate the proper integral, well, I've got to use my, my rules, my antiderivative rules. Uh, the problem is that the rules are not exa all exactly the same. If, if p equals 1, this is a 1 over x, and we're going to have a problem. We're going to get natural, well, it's not exactly a problem. We're going to get natural log of the absolute value of x. But if p is not equal to 1, if p is anything other than a 1, we would rewrite this as x to the negative p and use the power rule. So there are going to be two cases, one when p equals 1 and one when p is not equal to 1. So we've, we've restricted ourselves to p being greater than 0. Now we're going to restrict ourselves to two cases, p equals 1 and p is not equal to 1. So let's do p not equal to 1 first. So we're saying p not equal to 1 and p greater than 0. All right, so we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p that is written as this limit. And I'm going to rewrite this x to the p as x to the negative p. I'm bringing it up to the numerator. I'm changing the sign. OK. After you've, rewritten, after you've written your improper integral as a limit, then you evaluate the proper integral. So this is a proper integral. Fundamental theorem of a fundamental theorem of calculus applies to that. So we're going to apply it. OK. So I'm going to keep writing my limit, but I'm not really doing anything with it. I'm just sort of bringing it along. I'm going to use the power rule here. So I add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Then we substitute in x equals 1, substitute in x equals b, and subtract. Now this p and 1 are constants. Remember, when we were looking at our examples, here I've got p equals 3. Here I've got p equals 1 half. That's a constant for a particular p-series. It's a known. Now we're, we're trying to work out um, how these behave in general for different values of p. But for a particular p-series, that is a known. That's, and we want to evaluate the limit of this as b goes to infinity. And we're replacing x with a b and x with a 1. There are no p's here. Um, p's are constants, so we can factor those out. So I'm going to pull out the 1 over negative 1 plus, or negative p plus 1. I'm just going to write it in the reverse order. That's the same as 1 minus p times this limit as b goes to infinity of this. Now when I substitute in x equals b, I get b to the 1 minus p. And when I substitute in x equals 1, I get 1 raised to the 1 minus p. And of course, 1 to any power is going to be 1. So we just have this.
All right, so we have evaluated the integral. And now I wrote P, I'm so sorry, that's a B. After you evaluate the proper integral, you want to um, evaluate that final limit. Now here we have to be careful, because let's think about it. What happens to this as b goes to infinity? Well, I think it really depends. I think it depends, depends on the value of p. Because if p is between 0 and 1, so this is 1 minus a fraction, a proper fraction between 0 and 1, well then, this is going to be b to some positive power between 0 and 1. It might be something like b to the 1 half, b to the 1 third, b to the 9 tenths, but it's just going to be a fraction. And if I take b and I raise it to the 1 half power as b goes to infinity, I'm going to get infinity. But if p is greater than 1, 1 minus p in that case would be negative, and b if something that goes to infinity to a negative power, well, that behaves differently. So I think we have a couple of cases here. We said that this was case 1, where p is not equal to 1 and p is greater than 0. Um, now we're going to split it into two other cases. Let's look at case 1a and case 1b. In case 1a, let's assume that 1 minus p is positive. And remember, if 1 minus p is positive, if I solve this inequality for p, I get 1 is greater than p, which implies that p is less than 1. And remember our earlier restriction. We also said that p is greater than 0. So together, those tell us that p is between 0 and 1. OK, but this initial statement is saying that this exponent is positive. The positive exponent on the b. If that happens, the limit as b goes to infinity of b to the 1 minus p minus 1, it's going to be infinity. Because b, if this is a really large number, raised to a positive power, I'm going to get a really large number back. So it looks like if p is between 0 and 1, this integral, oops, I don't need a limit there, excuse me. This is 1 over 1 minus p times all of this. This integral diverges to infinity. OK, so that that's good. Now I know if p is a fraction between 0 and 1, um, the p-series diverges. Because remember, if the integral diverges, the corresponding series diverges. Okay, so that was case 1a. Now let's look at case 1b. It's the other possibility. Well, we said p was positive, p is not equal to 1. And then we looked at this, and we said, what if that exponent was positive? Well, then we've got a number, a very large number raised to a positive power, and we get infinity. Now, what if that exponent was negative? You guys all agree that if I multiply both sides of this equation by negative 1, that flips the inequality? Negative 1 times 0 is, of course, still 0. So I end up with p minus 1 has to be greater than 0. So if 1 minus p is negative, 1, or yeah, 1 minus p is negative, p minus 1 is positive. Okay, I wrote that down, or I can say p is strictly greater than 1 now. So that's the case that we're looking at. In this case, p is greater than 1, but this is the interesting part to me here. 
Now I want to evaluate this limit. I've got one over one minus p times the limit as b goes to infinity of b, which is getting to, going to infinity, it's gonna be a large number, raised to a negative power. Well, if that's negative, it's gonna be one over b to the same power but positive, and the positive version of that power is, is not one minus p, it's p minus one. It's what we get when we multiply that by negative one, put it in the denominator. Okay, so p minus one is positive. So now as b goes to infinity, I have b, it's a large number raised to a positive power, so this is a large number. One over a large number is a small number. Look at that. We get negative one over one minus p, or if you prefer, you can write that as one over p minus one. Hey, so I guess we found out that this integral converges to this value, one over p minus one, when p is greater than one. Now, we did not talk about it in the last video, but when it converges, that does not necessarily mean that the series converges to the same number. All that our theorem says is that if this integral converges, the corresponding series converges. So this integral converges, which means this P series converges. When P is greater than one. Okay, so that's cool. So now we've got, um, it converges when P is greater than one. We found out earlier the P series diverges when P is between zero and one. So now we just have two other cases to look at. We need to see what happens when p equals one and we need to see what happens when p is negative. Okay. Sound like a good plan? All right. So now let's look at the p equals one case. I always thought this case is pretty cool. Now remember, this is the series when p equals one. p is that power on the n. So this is called the harmonic series. So we get one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth. If you're wondering, how do you get those numbers, Miss Townsend? N is changing. So this is when N equals one, I get one over one. When N equals two, I get one over N, which is two. When N equals three, I get one over N, which is three. When N equals four, I get one over N, which is four. And then eventually I just get one over N. And we keep going forever. That's what the dots mean. This is the harmonic series. If I want to see whether the harmonic series um, converges or diverges, I need to look at the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx. Now we've already checked that f of x is positive, continuous, and increasing, or decreasing. Um, you can also just look at f of x. Remember what one over x looks like. It looks like that on that side, that on that side writing y equals f of x equals one over x. From one to infinity, it's clearly positive, because x is positive. It's continuous. The only problem is that x equals zero, and that's not on our interval, um, and it's decreasing. You can just look at the graph and see it's decreasing, or you can check algebraically the derivative of x to the negative one is negative x to the negative two, so it's negative one over x squared. x squared's positive, negative one is negative, so this is negative. The derivative's negative, so the function is decreasing. Okay, so all of our conditions check out. So 
if this integral converges, this series converges. If this integral diverges, this series diverges by the integral test. Okay, first thing you do is you write the improper integral as a limit. The problem happens at infinity, so we take the limit, or in that infinity is in the upper limit, so we take the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from one to b of one over x dx. So we always start that way, write the improper integral as a limit. Then we evaluate this integral. Easy enough. Antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of the absolute value of x. Then we plug in 1, we plug in b, and we subtract by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, and natural log of 1 is 0 because e to the 0 power is 1. Okay, so now I just need to think about what happens to natural log of b as b goes to infinity. This is the graph of y equals natural log of x, approximately. As x goes to infinity, very, very slowly, natural log of x crawls toward infinity as well. The slope of natural log of x is 1 over x. So if I plug in 50 here for x, the slope is 1 over 50. It's a tiny positive slope, but it's a positive slope. So it's going, it's growing very, very slowly to infinity. And it's growing slower and slower, but it's still growing. Um, so we're, we're glad it's still growing. Um, it's just not growing very fast. Um, still, it grows, and it grows to infinity. So the limit as b goes to infinity of natural log of b is infinity because this is slowly going to infinity. So we get infinity. We evaluated the proper integral and then we evaluated the limit. And then remember what that tells us. That's telling us that this improper integral, this area under this curve, that's an infinite area in some sense. That unbounded area, when we keep adding pieces to it, the area under the curve, well, it just keeps growing larger and larger and larger. It grows larger very slowly, but it grows larger. So that means this integral diverges, and that means the corresponding series, which we call the harmonic series, diverges. Or you can say that that's a special case of a p-series. That's a p-series with p equals 1. So p-series diverge when p equals 1. Okay, so now let's talk about all the conclusions we have so far for p-series. P-series look like this. Or we can algebraically manipulate them so that they they look like this. We said if they diverge when p equals 1, they diverge when p is between 0 and 1. And it, they, this series converges when p is greater than 1. Now the only case that we didn't talk about was p less than 1. Um, well let's just think about how that might work. So p is negative. Let's say it's this is negative or 1 over negative n or n, n to the negative 2, excuse me. Well, because of our exponent properties, I can bring this up to the numerator as long as I change that exponent from negative to positive. 
Now this is 1 plus, or 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. The nth term is getting larger and larger and larger. Actually, we did this, this example in a different video. As n goes to infinity, n squared is obviously getting larger. So the partial sums are obviously getting larger. So the partial sums are going to infinity because a sub n is going to infinity. Um, so this diverges. due to the nth term test for divergence. So, actually let me write it out. This is a limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n. That's my a sub n. And the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared is infinity. So this series diverges by the nth term test. You might say, well, what does that have to do with p-series? Well, that is an example of a p-series when p is negative. So in general, if p is negative, actually, I'm not going to call that an example. Let's just say in general, if we have the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the negative p, I've written it as negative p just to emphasize that this p is neg this p is positive, but then I multiply it by negative one. Um, so if you if you look at the denominator and you see a negative exponent there, um, then this is going to be n to the p with p positive. This will always diverge. This is if p is positive. by the nth term test for divergence. I hope the fact that I use positive p and negative p differently there doesn't bother you. Um, but the idea here is if you see a negative exponent down here, well then I have to end up putting that, that n to that same power but positive in the numerator and this will diverge. Um, so this p series up here diverges when p is between 0 and 1, including 1, because we get this logarithm when p equals 1. It converges when p is greater than 1. And we saw from this that if I've got a negative p value, I bring that up to the numerator, and then this is positive. Um, I don't use the integral test to show that this diverges when p is negative. I just use the nth term test for divergence. So this also diverges when p is negative. So, um, and I guess we didn't cover the, the zero case. What if p is zero? Well, that's n to the zero, which is one. I had to cover all the cases, guys. So that's the sum as n goes fr from one to infinity of one. So it's one plus one plus one plus one. Yeah, that's going to infinity, guys. That also diverges by the nth term test for divergence. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 is just 1. It's not 0. So this diverges. So we've got a p-series that diverges when p equals 0. Because when p equals 0, I've got n to the 0, which is 1. And 1 over 1 is 1. OK. So it diverges when p is a fraction between 0 and 1. It diverges when p equals 1. It diverges when p is negative. It divi diverges when p is 0. It converges when p is greater than 1. So let's write this down as a rule on the next page. All right, here's our p series test. If you have a series that looks like this, P series diverge when P is, excuse me, when P is less than or equal to 1 and they converge when P is greater than 1. That's it. 
So now you never have to use integral test again if you see something that looks like this. All you have to do is identify p. If you say 1 over n to the fifth, 5 is greater than 1, so it converges. 1 over n to the 1 third, 1 third is less than 1, so it diverges. Um, it's very easy, um, and the integral test is no longer necessary. But we did use the integral test to prove this, which means that the integral test is very powerful. And now we get to use this result all the time without having to take any integrals of anything. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so in the next video, we're going to solve more problems involving P-series. I'll also introduce some theorem, theorems, um, some laws about series, adding series together, multiplying series by constants, and so on, um, so that we can um, apply those to series that are related to P-series. And then we might do one more example of an integral test problem um, that doesn't involve P-series. Okay, so the major takeaways of this section are how to do the integral test, and um, how to determine whether a P-series converges or diverges, and this is our rule for P-series.